Welcome to the Lyon Township Public Library's Genealogical Event for January. Today we are pleased to have with us Jim Kraft from the Oakland County Historical Commission. And he is going to present our library with a copy of an Oakland County book. Oh, also this is in... Uh, Oh, what word am I looking for? We are celebrating the bicentennial of Oakland County from 1820 to 2020. So that in Jim is here to present us with a book uh, commemorating that event. And he's also going to give us a presentation on Oakland County. So let's welcome Jim to the library. Great. Well, thank you. All right, um, this, well, the Oakland County Bicentennial got started 200 years ago, but a year ago, those of us on the Oakland County Historical Commission were sitting around at our kind of annual little Christmas do, and Dave Walls and I, who is another member of the commission, got talking about things that we can do to help with that celebration. As it turns out, Dave had just acquired this book. And this book is a reprint of the first history of Oakland County that was completed in 1877. It's actually available in a lot of different places around the county. The problem is it's 140 years old. So where it exists, if you sit, went into a library to look at this book, there's going to be somebody like Kathy here that's going to sit over your shoulder and make sure you don't break it. <laughs> um, and so Dave and I got thinking that one of the things that would be useful for the libraries in the county and some of the historical societies that have reference libraries is to give to them a reproduction of that book as a part of the 2020 celebration. So that's where this came from. It was uh, something we kind of kicked off with about a year ago, got the books ordered, the county's paid for the books, and now I would like to donate this to the Lyon Public Library. Holly, if you want to come forward and collect this. So there's our book. Actually, let him speak. He's much better at There you are. Thank, thank you, very you very much. much. Thank you. So I wanted to uh, thank Mr. Kraft and the rest of the Oakland County um, Historical, Commission. Historical Commission yes. for uh, presenting us this book and for their uh, commitment to preserving the history of Oakland County and also to Kathy for being our local steward for history here in Lyon Township. So thank you very much. Alrighty. Okay, um, now another thing that the Historical Commission did along with some other folks uh, involved in uh, kind of celebrating the, uh, the Bicentennial is there's this little book about the history of Oakland County. Uh, there are free copies available back there by the display board. If you can grab one of those, that's fine. There's also a couple of books back there that uh, are related to the topic, but they're not about this particular presentation. Uh, there's a price tag on those though, so. But this one's a freebie. Um, okay, so with that, we're gonna get, okay, so we're gonna get rolling here. Um, so, in addition to uh, giving out the book, one of the things that was suggested is we actually use this book as the basis for a presentation on Oakland County. So that's why I'm here, is to give that presentation about yes. Oakland County. Uh, and essentially what we're going to do is to kind of tell some stories about Oakland County, but it's going to be using the book as essentially the outline uh, for the conversation tonight. Um, this book was published in 1877. The immediate catalyst for the production of this book seems to have been the centennial celebration of 1876. Um, and this was not published in a vacuum. There was something like, according to one bibliographer of county histories, there was something between 1,000 and 1,500 books very similar to this that were published in the 10 years between 1875 and 1884. The Oakland County book is just one of those 12, 13, 14, 1,500 books. Um, now, the principal catalyst for this, as I say, was the 1876 centennial. 
as is often the case when you have a nice centennial, like 100 years or 50 years or whatever, the tendency is for people to write books. Well, that's what happened here. If you looked at the front piece of many of these books that are published in this time frame, although it isn't true for the Oakland County book, there will be, well, it'll say in the front piece, centennial history. Um, so it's very common. Um, the other thing, that's one of the reasons behind this. The other reason is that essentially the area of the country that produced these books, most of it would have been west of the Appalachians and east of the Rockies, okay? Uh, in fact, really east of the Great Plains. That's where most of these county histories were produced. And the reason for that, I think, was really that that area was settled in the years after 1800 and principally after the War of 1812. And the people who did that settling, as of 1877, 1876, they were dying off. Okay, the generation that did that settlement of this area were fast disappearing. And so, uh, much like Tom Brokaw did in that whole history of the Second World War that occurred over the last 20 years, as these veterans were, um, were, were passing on, we collected a lot of information about World War II. Well, the exact same thing is happening here. Um, and this, this kind of a quote here, this one from John Jones of Bloomfield Township, in recalling these instances of pioneer days, a great many of which have passed from my mind, I seem as if it were to be living them over again. And I rejoice to know that steps are being taken to preserve a record of them, which if not done, will soon be among the things of the past and be forgotten forever. You will see statements like this in virtually every section of the book. Uh, in the section about Lyon Township. There's at least one quote in there that's very similar to this, where the, the old settlers are kind of commemorating the fact that somebody is taking the time to record their histories. The book would have been largely written probably by their children going back and talking to the old settlers. Okay. Uh, but obviously some of the settlers themselves are involved in putting this book together. Now, this book is about 300,000 words. It's something close to 400 pages. Uh, it's a monumental undertaking, really. Um, but it was produced in about six months. Uh, and there were, as I say, somewhere around 1,000 to 1,500 of these books produced around the country over a period of about 10 years. So there's a lot of production going on here, a lot of work going on. Uh, by a relatively small group of companies. I don't know exactly the number of people who produced this one, Everts, L.H. Everts and Company of Philadelphia. They did about eight of these county histories in Oakland County, or in Michigan, in this time frame. Um, but there are other companies producing these things, but it's a relatively small number. They were really cranking these things out. And what they needed to do was to have a methodology that was going to allow them to do this quickly. Um, this is an excerpt from one of the newspapers in Pontiac that actually Dave Walls, my associate, found as he was digging around in libraries trying to sort out the history of the book. This is from the Pontiac week, Weekly Bill Poster on April 25th, 1877. Messrs. L.H. Everts and Company, the enterprising publishers whose canvassers have been industriously at work for the past few months taking subscriptions for the contemplated history of Oakland County are now in the field with a thoroughly organized and able copy or core of artists and historians for the purpose of completing what has now been so well begun. A competent core of writers will be commencing immediately to collect data and materials for a general history of the county and a separate history of each city, village, and township. They will endeavor to visit in person all the old settlers and hope to be able to obtain interesting and reliable information in every corner of the county touching on the early settlements and the subsequent growth and the prosperity of the entire region now included in Oakland County. What happened is L.H. Everett sent um, a guy by the name of Samuel Durant to Pontiac. He set up shop in Pontiac uh, and began interviewing and collecting information from people in the county. Now prior to Durant's arrival, what had happened is essentially L.H. Everett sent out salespeople and they obtained subscriptions from people in the county essentially paying their money up front 
for the book, and once they got enough subscriptions, then they agreed to go ahead with the production. Okay, so that's the method they used. They got subscriptions enough to justify going forward with the publication. The book cost $9 in 1877. A working guy, a laborer, uh, you know, in a factory in 1877 made a buck a day. So $9 was a pretty substantial outlay. In addition to that, uh, as we'll show you later on, the people were also given the opportunity to pay for essentially lithographs of their farmstead to be included in the book. They could include photographs of themselves in the book, and they could include biographies of themselves in the book. All of those things would have been extra in ways that uh, Everts and company would have accumulated revenue to justify going through this, this work. The point is, this starts in April, the end of April 1877. It's done and published and purchasable by se September. Yeah, I know, how the heck they do that? <laughs> well, the way they did it is Samuel Durant and an assistant by the name of Pierce, and I can't remember his first name offhand, um, they show up here, and they're not so much, in my view, authors as they are editors. What they did was they kind of went out to the community and tried to get people in the community to provide them information and, in many cases, actually do the writing. And then uh, uh, Durant and Pierce are editing it, trying to put it sort of in one voice, although not exactly, um, and that's where the material comes from, most of it. Now, Durant and Pierce did some writing on their own. They certainly were taking information from their interviews and that sort of thing. And there's a section of the book that's clearly their work. But the bulk of this, 400 pages, 300 of it is really coming from somebody else. And then uh, Durant and Pierce are editing it. The other thing, oh, and then I mentioned the lithographs. There you go. Now, one of the techniques that they used is they put together and published in these various newspapers in Pontiac and perhaps other places, although we didn't find it any other place, um, was a series of questions. 30 questions maybe, 40 questions that they published and basically they pushed it out to the, to the residents of Oakland County and said, listen, if you can answer any of these questions, send us the answers. So these are the questions, and this is the whole list, and they phrased them differently, but this is the whole list of questions that they sent out. Um, it was a, this is about the pioneers primarily. So the firsts are important. Who built the first house? Where was the first church? Where was the, uh, the first road built? That sort of thing. So all of this firsts makes a lot of it. And as we get into a little bit of the book, you'll see that the, the layout of the book is simply following these questions in many, to a large degree. So they get the answers to these questions, it's fairly structured, and then they'll be able to put this together uh, in kind of a standard format and move forward very efficiently. Um, L.H. Everts and Company, who are preparing the history of Oakland County, are gathering material of every nature from which to make up the records. And Mr. Samuel Durant, a business and genial gentleman who is chief historical writer for the work, is now in the city looking after material in this locality. Mr. Durant is stopping at the Hodges House in Pontiac. That's the Hodges House. It's in the book. Um, and those who are in possession of facts connected with the personal and material history of the county should put him in possession of them. Um, so. That's Durant, working out of the Hodges house. Presumably he moved around the county a bit, he and Pierce. Um, but that's the, uh, that's the game. That's how they put this thing together. Uh, the layout of the book is really in three sections. The first section is kind of a general background of Oakland County, of Michigan, of the Great Lakes area, and a little bit of U.S. history. It's about 40 pages long. This is the section, I think, that Durant and Pierce wrote. Okay, one of the sections that they wrote. Uh, there's nowhere else to get it. Uh, and they're primarily attacking county records, secondary sources as they were available, and put together this general history. The bulk of the book, probably 300 of the 400 pages in here, are township histories. Each township, and there are 25 townships in the county, contain a chapter on, on that township. So there's a chapter on Lyon Township, for example. 
and Milford and Commerce and everybody else. And then there's a pretty big section about the city of Pontiac. Within each of those townships' histories, there's a little blurb on South Lyon, there's a little blurb on Kensington, there's a little blurb on you know, each of the individual villages. The bulk of this is the township histories, and that's where the great interest is. Um, the information is coming from county records, township records, is coming from these questionnaires, which is a major source. Uh, they're out interviewing, uh, talking to people who were some of the early pioneers and settlers here, and then they basically got other people to do the writing for them. So, for example, um, there's a bit about, in, in Lyon Township, there's a bit about the, the, the Methodist Church here. Um, it gets formed in, I don't know, the 1830s, I think. Somebody wrote that up for him, okay? Presumably the minister of the church in 1877. If the minister of a church didn't write something up, it probably isn't in the book. Okay, uh, So they, they took what they could get, uh, put it together very quickly, but this is not a comprehensive history. Okay, And then the final section of the book, another 20, 30 pages at the back end, is primarily on the regiments from, Oakland County, or from the state of Michigan and uh, servicemen that served in the Civil War. Uh, that's in the back of the book. Okay, there's, there's a, a fairly decent sized military history in the back of the book. Now, the, 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 I will say Civil War, they didn't call it the Civil War. They called it the War of the Rebellion. And in some cases, they referred to it as the War of the Slaveholders Rebellion. Um, so you'll see maybe 10% of the time it's the Slaveholders Rebellion, the other 90% of the time is, um, well, that was a faux pas. I, think I kicked it. Oh, just down here. Huh. Well, this is a complete disaster. What did it do? It seems to have the light on. I think I just have to turn it back on now. Oh, okay. Okay, well, let's see what we can do here to avoid that trick. <laughs> so again, the South would have called this the War of Northern Aggression. The North called it the War of the Slaveholders' Rebellion. Okay, and that's how it's referred to throughout the book, is the War of the Rebellion. Um, okay. It's hot, and I'm wondering if that's why it's not coming back on quickly. I don't know. Um, okay, well... Um, here it comes. I can see it faintly coming. Okay. Yeah. yeah, there you go. So the, the township chapters themselves are broken into sections. This isn't consistent, but more or less, this is the way they all wind up looking. They'll start off with a little bit about geography, um, a little bit about the first. Uh, in most cases, I suppose I should change that in the geography section. Usually it's, there's a bit about the Native Americans that were here. That's not true in necessarily every township, but it's certainly true here in Lyon Township. And then they'll have a section on the various villages that might be in that township and so on. Um, in terms of volume, I have the ones that are bold here, are the sections that tend to be the largest. It's not consistent because it depends on the material they got, but these bolded sections tend to be pretty large. The town meeting section is actually one that's especially interesting. It's only talking about usually the first few years of town meetings in these, these townships, but it's actually pretty interesting the kinds of material you get out of that. And we'll talk about some of those a little bit later on. Um, so the first, the religion, and then the biography section are probably the largest in most of these township histories. The biographies are something that you want to look at uh, because they, are, they really give you a lot of information about what these people experienced in coming to Oakland County. There's a lot of good stuff in the biography, so don't skip past that. Um, so the biographies, this is the kind of stuff they'll give, give you. Um, if you want to, it, the only kind of real political history that's going on in here is you'll get occasional references to this guy was a Republican or this guy was a Jacksonian, this guy was a Whig and then he became a Republican, stuff like that. It's not very detailed at all about political stuff. Uh, and then usually the biographies are going to have, you know, a, a, a 
photograph that has been converted into a lithograph. You give us a photograph, we'll send it to Philadelphia, convert it into a lithograph, and put it in the book. So here we have a, a very happy couple. Mm -hmm. The Buttons, they're from Lyon Township, as it turns out, but they seem to be having a really good time. Um, so again, the biographies are pretty important. Now, um, this book is not great history. It is a great book, it's just not great history, <laughs> okay? And the reason why I say that is that there's really no attempt to provide a comprehensive history of Oakland County. That's not what this is doing, and it's really not closely monitored for accuracy. They take the material they get, and that's what they kind of give you back, okay? It's not like these guys are out digging to verify facts. They weren't. There will be places when you'll see kind of contradictions, not serious ones. They took care of those pretty well, it seems, because you don't see much. But th there's a lot of duplication. In, in one section, I think it was in the Farmington Township, on four successive pages, they tell you the first house that was built in Farmington. Well, why is that? Because four different people wrote those sections, okay? And they didn't smooth this out at all. So it's not, it, it flows pretty well. It's one voice, uh, it's, it's a fun read, but you know, again, let's not mistake it for great history. And one of the reasons I think it's not great history is it's by and large oral history. And oral history is a problem uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I mean, mainly, well, there's a, a number of things. Let's imagine that you're going to sit down and write uh, an oral history, and you're going to talk about stuff you did 40 years ago. You can remember it all pretty accurately, are you? <laughs> oh, yeah, real accurately. Um, it's going to be filled with, with memory lapses. It's going to be filled with 40 years of you kind of coloring your past and creating a narrative for your life that may not be completely accurate. Okay? The other problem with oral history is it's about this wide. You want to study the, the invasion of Normandy in, on June 6, 1944 by reading the oral history of one of those guys who hit the beaches on Omaha Beach? What are you going to get? You're going to get what he saw in front of him. You're going to find out about the guy who was right and the guy who was left, and that's it. There is no field of vision in oral history. Uh, they talk about their own experience. It's interesting, but it's not very broad. And the consequence is, as history, the only way oral history actually works is you need lots of them in order to kind of put together the generalizations. Well, the good news is there's lots of them in here. And so individually, any of these tales that people are telling you may not be great, terribly accurate. They're very narrow in their focus. But collectively, and there's a lot of these oral histories in here, it's primarily oral history, you're getting a real good view of what life was like in Oakland County in between roughly 1820 and 1877. Okay. Um, all right. Now, another thing, and this kind of ties into my concern with oral history, or the problem with oral history, is that in my view, you should think of history as a mosaic. When you look at American history, what you're doing is you're stepping back and you're looking at a mosaic and from a distance that mosaic gives you a clear picture of the whole story. Um, local history, oral history, local history generally is this. You move up close and you see the detail. You know, these guys have an interesting story to tell and it'll be a great story. But where does it fit in the big picture? Okay, you don't know because you're up too close. Okay. Uh, in my view, local history needs to be told from a perspective of looking up close and seeing these individual stories, but then you need to back up and get an idea of what the big picture looks like. Then you can go back in, and then you've got to come back out. Now, that isn't typically the way local history is written, and that's not the way this book is written. It's all up close and personal, except that first section, those first 40 pages and the last 20 pages. They're mostly big picture stuff. But in the, in the meat of this, it's all this, okay? And the problem with that is you miss the story, uh, the big story. And so one of the things that we wanted to do in this presentation is to kind of step back and talk about some of the big picture stuff and then close in and look at what's going on, or really talk about what's going on at the local history level, 
the township level, and then back up and talk about a little bit where this fits in the big picture of American history. So that's mostly what we're going to be doing here. Um, and just kind of as a background to this, it's important to think about this whole stuff is unfolding. This entire book is unfolding in the 19th century, and these are the major themes that I think you could use to describe what's going on in the United States and to some extent the world, certainly the Western world, in the 19th century. First and foremost is this is the century really of the industrial and transportation revolutions that changes human history like no other century before it. Life in 1800 moved at the speed of a walk. Everything you wore, everything you ate was produced locally. If you couldn't make it yourself or trade it with your neighbors, you just don't have it. And whatever you had, it wasn't very much. You know, by the time we get to 1877, there's department stores in every reasonable sized city in the country. You know, if factories are cranking out stuff at unprecedented rates. And if you want to get from Chicago to, to New York in 1877, you get on a train, you're there in 24 hours. In 1800, it would have taken you a couple of months. It's just an entirely different world. Entirely. So that's underpinning all of this, and yet there isn't a single point in here where anybody ever mentions in the Industrial Revolution or the Transportation Revolution. It isn't there because they're up close and personal. But it's, it's really the background to what's going on here. Um, it, throughout the 19th century, Western society is becoming increasingly democratic, primarily as a result of the Enlightenment, the American Revolution, and in particular, the French Revolution. So all of Europe is becoming more democratic. The United States is becoming very democratic up until about 1850 when I think things start to move the other direction. And the reason it starts to move the other direction is up until 1850, this is very much is a rural agricultural community, world that we lived in in the United States. In 1850, you start to tip the corner towards the industrialization of the United States and an increasing disparity in wealth. Whereas in 1840, this was a very egalitarian country, by 1890, you have huge disparity in wealth. You know, the Andrew Carnegie's and the John Rockefeller's and the J.P. Morgan's and all that gang, um, they control virtually everything and there's only a handful of them, uh, they include, including the controlling the economy and politics. Westward migration. I mean, this book is about westward migration. I mean, in 1800, everybody lives close to the Atlantic seaboard. By 1850, California is a state. Okay. By the time this book is written, we're about a decade away from the U.S. Census declaring the frontier is no, no longer exists in America. Okay. We're not quite there now, but close. Uh, the place of blacks in American society is underlying of this. Now, it's not a big issue here in Oakland County. There are very few blacks here in the county in 1877. But as national issues, since 1820, it's been about the squabble between North and South over slavery. The um, abolitionist movement, the, the tension leading up to the Civil War, the war itself, which saw the death of 600,000 men, the freeing of slaves, Reconstruction, and the reimposition of white control in the South with the Jim Crow laws. All of that's sitting here. Okay? And then the great religious revival that sweeps through the United States in the first half of the 19th century, the Second Great Awakening, which really creates Protestant America that we think of today. All of this stuff above is being processed in the minds of most Americans through the lens of this great religious revival known as the Second Great Awakening. There's plenty of example of the Second Great Awakening in these books, in this book, and in these chapters. Um, so those are sitting there. But again, uh, you won't see the word Second Great Awakening in here. You won't see uh, Reconstruction, even though 1877 is the year Reconstruction ends. There's no mention of it, but it's there, and you have to kind of appreciate that. This is just a list just to kind of help you put this in the proper context from a time frame perspective of what's going on. Here's just kind of some bullet points of things that went on in the 1870s up to 1877. Okay, so that's, this stuff is all going on roughly contemporary with this book being written. Okay. Um, another thing that's important to recognize as kind of background material is that Oakland County in 1877 was purely an agricultural county. We farmed, and then beyond that, we, you know, farmed. And that was it. Um, 
Oakland County was, throughout most of the 19th century, the leading agricultural county in the state. It's number one in most categories. Now one of the reasons it's a, a slightly bigger county than most counties, we have 25 townships, most township, counties only had 20 townships. Um, so we're a little bit bigger. But again, it, it's settled early, it's good land, and Oakland County was very prosperous as a farming community, plus the fact it's close to a major market, which is Detroit. And it has railroads and at least a few roads, so it's really well positioned. The thing that's really interesting about this is the population data up here, uh, which you probably can't see any of this. Um, and frankly, the, the census I'm going to talk about will be the 1860 census and the 1900 census. In 1860, the population of Oakland County was 40,000. The state was about almost 900,000, 800,000. In 1900, the population of Oakland County was 44,000, and the count or the state was two and a half million. Now think about that. The county was the state was 850,000 in 1860, and it's two and a half million in 1900. The county is 40,000 in 1860 and 44,000 in 1900. What does that tell you? Farmers stayed farming. Farmers stayed farming. They didn't go into towns and work in mills or factories. If they were doing that, the population of the county would have grown. It didn't. It maxed out as a farming community pretty much by 1860, it stays there. And the county doesn't grow. And why doesn't it grow? Because there's no more land for more farmers. And while the next generation had to find something to do, unless they inherited the farm, or could buy a farm from somebody who had died, essentially, um, they had to leave. They had two choices. They could go west, or they could go into a city and work in the factories. And I, I don't know where they went. It would be a nice study to figure out where the children of 1870, Oakland County, where they wound up. But what is certainly true is they didn't go to cities in Oakland County. Otherwise, the population would have been much higher than 44,000 in 1900. There just is very, very little manufacturing in the county. Now, that changes once you get past uh, 1900 and really past 1910 as we start to plug into the auto industry and start to become a bedroom community for Detroit. But in 1900, this is still purely a farming community. So, um, the settlement of Michigan really begins after, this, after the War of 1812, but not immediately after the War of 1812. It really isn't until the 1820s that Oakland County starts to grow. There's a little bit of settlement right after the War of 1812, but not much. Um, now, what's the catalyst for the movement? And why the delay? Well, the catalyst for the movement is the end of the War of 1812. Up until that point, Native Americans, with the backing of the British Empire, were an effective block on substantial settlement in large parts of the Trans-Appalachian West and certainly everything north of central Ohio and Michigan and Wisconsin. The Native Americans with British backing were sufficiently strong enough to prevent any of that settlement. The War of 1812 comes along, uh, the Indians in this area are smashed at the Battle of the Thames over in Ontario. You've probably all heard of Tecumseh and his uh, very dramatic leadership of the Indian nations in the, the Midwest and in fact to some extent, perhaps the entire, uh, everything west of the Appalachians, but certainly in this part of the country, he's killed at the Battle of the Thames. The British decide they're no longer going to be backing these Native Americans in their effort to resist white settlement. And so it, the, pretty much the game's up for the Native Americans. The second thing is that New York, which is where almost all of these early settlers that come to Michigan come from, New York fills up. Just as I mentioned, Oakland County fills up by 1860. It's fully populated as an agricultural community. Western New York pretty much fills up by the time you get to the 1830s. Okay. I've done some study of, of rural counties in Western New York. I'm not talking about you know, the counties where you have big cities like Buffalo and Rochester and Auburn and that sort of thing. I'm talking about the real rural counties. They maxed out in population in 1840 and didn't grow again until after 1960. Okay. 
Um, so the point is, as farming communities, Western New York gets filled up, certainly in the 1830s and in many places before that. And so now the next generation, what are they gonna do? Go west, young man. And where do they go? Well, they jump on the Erie Canal, go to Buffalo, get on a steamship, and come to Detroit. And in Detroit, they buy an ox cart and come north to Oakland County. That is absolutely the pattern that you're gonna find from virtually everybody who comes into this county in the 1820s and 30s. Oh, the other thing is this, <laughs> one of the delays, why there's a little bit of hesitation after the War of 1812. This guy over here, Edward Tiffin, was the surveyor general of the federal government for the Northwest Territory, which of course includes Michigan. This is his comment about Michigan. There is not one acre out of 100 that would in any case admit of cultivation. The next, actually the next sentence says, it's really more like one out of a thousand. Well, gee, that's where I want to go and be a farmer. <laughs> I'm going to pack up and go to Michigan. I don't think so. And the Tiffin argument held sway for 10 years. Okay. Um, southeastern Michigan is kind of an extension of the Black Swamp. And it is kind of impenetrable. And that extends into Oakland County. I mean, I live in Royal Oakland, lived in Royal Oak all my life, pretty much. And as a, as a kid, our backyard would flood every rainstorm. It was just a morass in our backyard and the backyard of everybody else in Royal Oak. Okay, it wasn't until the Red Run Drain gets built that we kind of dried out a bit. Um, but the point is that people coming north had to come out of Detroit, essentially cross through the leftovers of the Black Swamp. It wasn't called that, but essentially that's what's going on. And come north, and you had to get north of Royal Oak before you're gonna run into dry land. What they call in the book, hard land. Now, what happens is that Lewis Cass here in 1819, he goes off with a little exploration. You get a few adventurous folks uh, that lived in Michigan uh, during the War of 1812, like Stephen Mack, who settles Pontiac, and oh, by the way, is the uncle of Joseph Smith of Mormon fame. Um, he goes north with a company to Pontiac in 1818. So you get a few settlers in places in Oakland County early, a few explorations, and the net result is that by 1824, you can get this. Taking into view the price of public land, that is a dollar and a quarter an acre, the quality of the soil, the facility to market, which will be offered by the New York Erie Canal, a big deal, the salubrity of the climate and the resources of the county, country at large, I have never seen greater inducements to immigration presented either for purposes of agriculture or, note this, speculation. Okay, guy's trying to make a quick buck turning over some land. Um, this now starts to become the view of Michigan by the time you get to the mid-1820s. And Michigan begins to settle. The problem is it doesn't move very quickly. The 1820s are relatively slow. The early 1830s are relatively slow. Some of it stopped by the cholera epidemic in 1832, the Black Hawk War in 1832, uh, which really wasn't much, but it scared off people. But it's really in the mid-1830s that Michigan just goes wild. Okay. It only lasts a couple of years, uh, but it's really Michigan is the destination of choice in the United States in the mid-1830s. Now, this is something that's really important to kind of process and, and think about as you go through this book. Um, when you go to re read about somebody, they don't tell you that they live at the corner of, you know, Milford and 12 Mile Road. You know, what they tell you is they're in the northeast quarter of the northeast quarter of section seven. That's how you refer to it. Everything is about section and the portion of the section and the township you're in. Now all of this comes from the Northwest Ordinance that was passed by Congress in 1787. All of the unsettled land in the United States was to be surveyed according to this ordinance. Essentially what happened is you would go out into the woods, literally out into the woods, and there would be a, a kind of an artificial line drawn. Uh, um, uh, a baseline that run, would run across whatever region we're talking about. What's that baseline called today? Eight yeah, it's Eight Mile Road. Eight Mile Road doesn't run all the way across the state, but the baseline does. And then it's intersected by another line, a meridian, the range line, 
And at the point those intersect, that's where you start the survey. Okay? Now this happens to be just northwest of Jackson a little bit. You can go get in your car. There's now a nice park there. Uh, you can park in a parking lot, walk maybe a quarter of a mile or a half mile back, and get into the point where these two lines intersect. Take your boots. Right? It's a bit swampy right? at <laughs> certain times of the year. Uh, it's a boardwalk, though, so you'll be okay. But they have to be a boardwalk because it's a swamp. Okay, that's the intersection. And what happened is that in order for land to be sold, it had to be surveyed first. So you would send out surveyors, usually a team of three. They'd have a pole. They'd have a chain that would be 66 feet long, a metal chain. Uh, and they'd have a compass. And one guy would stand there and say, okay, we're at this point. Okay, I want you to walk that way until the, the, the chain is stretched out as far as it can go. That's 80 feet. And he's got there his compass. He's saying, no, no, a little bit to the left. A little bit there. Okay, put a stick in the ground right there. And then he'd walk down and he'd find that spot again. And he'd say, all right, now take the chain, go that way. Put a stick in the ground. Okay, cool. They do that 80 times and they get to the end of a section that's one mile away. And then they just keep going. And every point they got to that section line, that one mile distance, they'd put a pole in the ground, right on a little tag of some sort, that this is the end of section one range, I don't know. Uh, they define which township you were in, like the township four north, range five east. And they'd say, okay, that's the intersection of township, or section one, two, 11, and 12. They'd stick that pole in the ground. Anybody who wants to buy any land has to go out in the woods, find what section that is, and then figure out what piece of land they want to buy. They then go back to Detroit, which is where the land office was, and they'd enter their claim in, and they would pay for the land at that point. And they would define it as something like the northeast quarter of the northeast quarter of section seven range, township range Four, uh, township 4 North, Range 3 East, or something like that. That's how you'd verbalize it. And that's what everybody had to do. It's the only way you could do this. Now, you could buy a pig and a poke. You could just go to the land office and say, okay, I want to buy that. But when you get there, you might be in the middle of a swamp or a lake. So it was always much safer to go out and survey the land first, figure out where you were at, and then come back and buy the land. But the only way you could do it is you had to find those poles stuck in the ground. So, you know, you get some smart-ass 18-year-old who's going out there throwing the poles in the ground. <laughs> you, know, you know, there'd be a problem. Or the Native Americans. Maybe we should use those for kindling. Um, you know, so it was, it was really uh, an incredible operation. There's a section in the book about Herbie Park. It's all four or five pages, and it talks about his experience as a surveyor. He surveyed in this area, actually as far west as Iowa, for about 12, 15 years. Great stuff. It really is fascinating. Now the land itself was sold, most of it was sold according to the Land Act of 1820. And in that, again, you'd have to go out and identify the land you wanted to buy. You would come back, and after the Land Act of 1820, your eight, you could buy a minimum of 80 acres for a buck and a quarter an acre. So essentially for $100 you can get 80 acres. You had to pay cash. Okay. Now that replaced a previous auction system where you could come in and the land, once it was surveyed, it would be open up to auction and bidders could come in and buy whatever land they wanted. Um, and then after that auction took place, then you'd have to pay a minimum, or you'd pay $2 an acre. Um, you had to buy at least 160 acres and you, but you could do it by only putting a quarter of that down and the balance was due, I think, after five years. The first method favored the speculators. These other laws, the Land Act of 1820, the Preemption Act, the Homestead Act, all of these are laws that are favoring the settlers. It's the democratization of America. Okay, this, you know, in the early days, you know, the George Washingtons of the world go out and they buy this land. But now this is designed so that the individual settlers will have a better shot at getting land. It's not that speculators can't do this, and it's not that legitimate settlers couldn't do this. But the law, this law favors speculators. These laws favor the, uh, the settlers. 
Now, um, you have all of these townships in Oakland County and in Michigan have to get surveyed. Most of the county, or most of the state, at least the lower half of the state, seems to have been surveyed by the late 1820s. I really don't know when all of Oakland County was settled, uh, or surveyed rather. Um, what I do know is that all of these townships are beginning settlers, you know, at least by 1830, which means that the, the townships had been surveyed. Have you ever been to the Surveyor's Museum in Lansing? I have not. I have not. There's some very interesting publications there. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. I've been to some of the presentations, but I haven't been to the museum. Anyway, um, now these townships are surveyed. That's by law. So you have survey townships are created. Governmental townships are different. They are not necessarily survey townships. So, for example, in Oakland County, initially when Oakland County is, is created in 1820, there are two townships, Oakland and Bloomfield townships. So the county's basically split in half. Um, and then over the course of the next, well, 17 years, all of the current townships, the 25, convert from being survey townships by law, uh, federal law, into governmental townships which was basically Michigan's choice. Most of the townships in, most of the governmental units in at least the southern half of Michigan uh, have these township governments. As you get further north, fewer people, the township governments don't exist necessarily, or at least as townships, they're much bigger than the six by six that we have around here. Um, so converting these survey townships to governmental townships was an option that the state of Michigan had. There was no option as to uh, whether or not you were going to have these survey townships. Now the migration that we talked about, uh, or migration to Michigan, basically follows this pattern. Most of the people who came to Michigan in the time frame we're talking about, prior to the Civil War, really prior to the 18, say 1850, they came from western New York. They got to Western New York from Western New England. These were typically old stock Yankees whose ancestors had come to America in the 18, or 1630s, 1640s, stuff like that. They go into, well, wind up drifting off to Western New England, and after the, the Revolutionary War, the Iroquois Confederation, who more or less backed the wrong horse in the Revolution, they backed the British, George Washington sent a couple of armies in there in the 1870s, smashed the Iroquois Confederation, and then in the 18, 1790s, essentially the Iroquois sold up. And in a couple of major land deals, Western New York becomes open to settlement. And the people that move in there are these Western New Englanders. They skip the Hudson River Valley and move into Western New York. They skip the Hudson River Valley because that had been settled during colonial days. But now as this land in Western New York becomes free, they move there. And then as you start to get to the 1820s, 1830s, um, these guys are packing up and moving further west, following the Erie Canal, and then by the early 1820s, there's steamboats beginning to operate on Lake Erie, and they go west. Northern Ohio, northern Indiana, northern Illinois, Wisconsin, and of course, Michigan. And then from there, kind of the next generation includes people that are moving further west, um, so that's the migration that we're talking about here. Um, and here's a little bit here, just to give you a flavor for this. In Lyon Township, these are the, the people who are identified as early settlers in the county. And I'm just going down a list on one page of these early settlers and the ones that actually tell us where they came from. Um, and by the way, before we start this, let me flip to the New York map. Seneca County, Ontario County, Monroe County, Wayne County. This is, again, this is just a random list. Robert Purdy came from Seneca County, New York. John Thayer came from originally New York State. We don't know what county. Ella Flat Sprague came from Seneca County, New York. Russell Alvord came from Monroe County, New York. Um, James Sinclair came from Ovid in Seneca County. Uh, Levi Wilson, the first township clerk, came from Monroe County in New York. Thomas Dumlack came from Seneca County in New York. But it is surmised that he originally came from 
Vermont. So oftentimes you'll get people that were born someplace, but they moved to western New York before they came to Michigan. And it's very common to have people be born in New England, come to western New York, maybe as a kid, and then move to Michigan as, as, a, as an adult. Um, Thomas Selman uh, from Canandaigua, which is in Ontario County, I believe. Uh, Joseph Blackwood um, came from Seneca County in 1832. Ira Olds came from Seneca County. Israel Whipple came from Ontario County. Joseph Hayes came from, and on it goes. I mean, that's really what you're going to see. You'll get some folks coming up from Pennsylvania. You'll get some folks coming from New Jersey. Uh, you'll get the oddball coming from, you know, Virginia. Um, and you'll get some folks coming from, from the UK. But the vast majority of them are coming from Western New York. Okay. Now, the trip here is kind of interesting. So let's take a look at Jonathan Pixley. I was born AD 1799 in the township and county of Tioga in the state of New York, of course. I lived there until March 1823 when my family moved to Monroe County, which is further west uh, in New York. I lived there eight years uh, when in company with my late brother David, I emigrated to Michigan. We started from Brockport, which is just west of Rochester, on the Erie Canal um, on Thursday, the 12th of May. Remember that date. Um, on Thursday, the 12th of May, 1831, and arrived in Buffalo the Saturday following. We stayed there until Monday morning. Note, they did not travel on Sunday. Um, when we shipped on board the steamer William Penn, after a very rough voyage, we arrived in Detroit on the 20th at about 4 o'clock. So eight days after they started the trip, they're in Detroit. Um, we put up at the Old Yankee Boarding House. Um, after breakfast the next day, I put out to find a yoke of oxen. I soon found some for $65. They almost always used oxen. They were not using horses here. They were using oxen. Uh, went to a shop and bought a yoke for them, and driving down to the dock, hitched them up to my wagon. Presumably, he brought his wagon with him on the canal boat and as well as on the steamship, which is kind of interesting. Put on a few things, drove up to the tavern, put my family on board, and started for Oakland. The mud was hub deep. And I had to walk by my oxen's head, for I did not know what caper they might cut up. We came to what is now called Four Mile House and spent, spent the night. Um, let's see. Uh, then the next morning they go off. At noon we arrived at a place called Mother Handsome's. If you read anything about these migrants coming out of Detroit in this time period, they all stop at Mother Handsome's, who's apparently kind of an interesting old bird. Uh, she was pretty old, and a, a bit of a, I don't know, a crank. Um, took our dinner there, but had nothing for my oxen. I said to the old lady that we were not very hungry, but wanted a good cup of tea. She said, by God, you shall have it. <laughs> All right. Um, we got it so strong, I didn't know whether it was herb tea or what. After dinner, we started from there and further, uh, came further on to Chase's Corner. Oh, by the way, Mother Hanson is about 10 mile in Woodward. She was pretty much right on the Saginaw Trail, Woodward Avenue, at about 10 Mile Road. After dinner, we started from there and came fur further on to Chase's Corners. Now, Chase's Corner is the intersection of Crooks and 13 Mile Road. Okay. Um, Mr. Chase let me turn my oxen out to eat. They ate up what was there in a hurry. I bought a bushel of potatoes and started on. Our next stopping point was Mrs. Guy Phelps in Troy. It being Saturday night, we stayed there until Monday morning. They're not traveling on Sunday. Sunday is the day of rest, right? Um, when we took an early start for our home, got as far as Benjamin Horton's by noon where we took dinner, after which we resumed our journey and arrived to our present home on the northeast quarter of section, northeast quarter, section 23, then in the township of Oakland, now Avon Township, on the 23rd day of May. Uh, yeah, so it took them 11 days stopping two of those days. But they came from New York to Michigan, right? To their home up there. Nothing much occurred during the summer worthy of note, <laughs> right? <laughs> a little different standard of excitement than I think we'd have. Until the 12th of September, when all but myself were taken ill with typhoid fever. This was a great drawback, you think. Um, drawback for us, but I had good and kind neighbors for which I shall always be thankful. I mean, you can find 50 stories just like that in this book. Okay. 
um, probably more. Um, and it just kind of repeats itself. There's, they're always talking about the, you know, the mud coming up from Detroit. They're using oxen. They're stopping at Mother Hansen's, uh, stuff like that. It's just repetitious to some extent. And when they got to wherever they were going, there's a pretty good chance that there were Native Americans in the neighborhood. Now, they probably weren't living there year-round, but they were seasonal residents, I would guess, in most cases. Um, the Indians were usually very quiet and peaceable, and for a number of years after the first settlement uh, were made, hunted and fished around the beautiful lake, that's White Lake. Undoubtedly, they were much grieved when the time came for them to be removed from its locality. The treaties that were signed with the Native Americans, here's, you can see the dates of those treaties. Let's see if I can actually get it all here without turning everything off. Um, you can see the dates of these treaties and the chunks of land in Michigan that are given over to white settlement. Those treaties included provisions that the Native Americans could stay until they were needed for white settlement. So when the first settlers came in, they didn't have to leave. But eventually, enough of them came that they had to move out. Um, this is from Lyon Township. In fact, let me find that. Um, the pioneer remembers the indolent aborigine. Indolent. Think about this. It's an interesting phrase. White men came in here to conquer the wilderness. The Native American lived with the wilderness. Okay? It's a whole different view of how you're going to live your life. Uh, the Indian didn't have to go out there and chop down all the trees. The whites did. Right? So they looked indolent to Europeans. Um, the Indian Aborigine and has taken, uh, as he takes a calm retrospection of the past and recalls the days of yore when the stalwart brave spread his blankets within the pale of civilization and gradually under the beneficent influence of white men's kindness commenced a friendship which endured until, the rem until their removal beyond the Missouri. Um, methinks he will be filled with momentarily at least with pity at their present lot and compassion for the future. Uh, I, there's more here about that, but I'm, I'm just going to stop there. The point here is this, that when the whites first came into this part of the country, there were these treaties that the Indians had signed more or less after the War of 1812, although there is an 1807 treaty here that affects Oakland County. Um, but then, in, oops, in 1830, the federal government passed a, a bill requiring all Native Americans to move west of the Mississippi. Every Indian lived east of the Mississippi, had to move west of the Mississippi. This is the famous Indian Removal Act. You're probably familiar with the Trail of Tears. That's what the Trail of Tears is all about, is this removal of the Native Americans east of the, west of the Missouri. Michigan didn't, that didn't much affect Michigan. There appear to have been about 500 Potawatomi that were living in the area of Kalamazoo. They were forcibly removed. But most of the Native Americans in Michigan apparently moved north. They stayed in Michigan. Uh, they didn't get caught up in the removal. They left, okay? And they left because they really had no choice, but they weren't rounded up by troops and marched across the Mississippi. At least the, that would have, seems to have only applied to a very small number of Native Americans. One of the interesting things is that in looking at um, some statistics, it appears as though there were about 400,000 Native Americans east of the Mississippi when the Indian removal started in 1830. When it ended around 1850, there were about 18,000 Native Americans still east of the Mississippi. Six to 8,000 of them still lived in Michigan because they didn't really get caught up in this forced movement west. They had to leave. And if they got in the way, like the Pot Potawatomis did, they'd have been forcibly moved out. But as it is, they kind of shifted and went north. Okay? And by the time you get into the 1850s, more or less, the federal government has said, nah, we're done with it. Okay? And in fact, the legislature of Michigan petitioned Washington to not forcibly remove the Native Americans left in Michigan. That was in 1850, I think. The, really, the policy ends about 1854. Um, you know, treated badly, but the worst aspects of the Indian removal didn't have much of an impact in Michigan. Uh, again, they got chased out, but they went north. Um, in Pontiac and Auburn, sickness was the greatest obstacle which settlers had to encounter. Many families buried all their children 
with the dreadful fevers and many children lost both parents and had to be sent to their friends back east. That's almost the only reference I have to in this book about um, this kind of statement about health. And I couldn't figure that out. Uh, I mean, because it really isn't, I mean, this is true, okay, this is accurate, but there's, it's almost the only mention of it. I mean, you see references to people dying of various diseases occasionally, but it's not very extensive at all. And there's no kind of general statement like this. And I wondered why. And I guess my answer to that is they took it for granted. It didn't require comment because they expected this stuff to happen. It's common. Right? Life expectancies were low. In particular, um, uh, infant mortality was high. This is 1870. 1870, 40 years after, 50 years after the real settlement of Michigan starts, 160 children out of 1,000 would die within the first two years. 16%. Then uh, mothers would die at the rate of six mothers per 1,000 live births, per 1,000 births, which seems, well, that's not good, but it's not ridiculous. But what if you have 10 kids? Okay, six, seven kids. Now that number starts to get pretty scary for an individual woman. Right. Um, one of the things that does show up uh, continuously is a comment like this. The fruits of this marriage have been a family of 13 children, of whom 10 are still living. The fruits of this, of this marriage were six children, of which three are still living. That's Benjamin Button's family, by the way. Six more and three still living. Um, not Benjamin Button, whatever that Button guy was, that family that I showed you, the Cheery family right at the beginning. That Cheery family, they had three of their six kids that's still alive. You're going to see this kind of comment, even when they had five children and five are still alive. They're all still living. The comment is there. Um, so they don't say that there was all this disease, but they do record how many of their children died. And it's pretty depressing when you read that. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is uh, you'll see plenty of comments about, uh, you know, the wife died, you know, M Mrs. Jones died in, Miss, uh, in you know, August of 1839, and Mr. Jones remarried in January of 1840. And, you know, it's, they remarried, okay, they remarried, and it didn't take them, you know, five years or ten years, you know, a few months later they get married. Um, they had to. This is a, these are economic relationships. The women need somebody that's going to provide them with a home and, and raw material to cook. The man needs somebody that's going to provide him with food and take care of the kids. And oh, by the way, you know, having sex every once in a while isn't all that bad for either of them, so they get married. Uh, you know, and that's kind of what this is. Um, I'm not saying in every case, they weren't exactly arranged marriages, but it was an economic necessity. And then I ran across this, which I thought was kind of interesting. This is a guy who comes here in the 1830s with his parents. He's a young man, and he lives with his parents. And then his mom dies, and I think maybe his dad dies fairly soon in the year, but I'm not sure at this point. In any event, sometime after the death of my mother, then I began to see the need of a helpmate. So I married Mary, Miss Mary Ann Wright in December of 1839. She's been great. <laughs> you need the help me. You need the partnership to survive. Okay. But you're going to find continuous references to uh, you know, one spouse dying and then remarrying very quickly. Women dying, men dying, remarrying. Um, you do have a lot of the, the general diseases that would kill in 1840 that we don't think of today. Measles, of course, that type of thing. Um, you'll see a few references to whooping cough, smallpox, one or two to, to malaria, or not malaria, but um, diphtheria. diphtheria. Um, you see fairly common references to digestive ailments, bad water, bad milk. Okay. Uh, not much really on the way of, of great epidemics, which kind of surprised me. There's no mention of the cholera epidemic of 1832, which really kind of surprised me. What you do see is a lot of reference to fever and ague. What's that? 
Malaria. Malaria. It's malaria. Uh, so you see a lot of reference to fever and ague, and you're going to see a lot of references to mosquitoes. Um, we came to what is known as the Four Mile House. We stayed all night, but little sleep did we get for the mosquitoes were determined to have their fill. And you're going to see this kind of off-the-cuff remark 20, 30 places in the book. Uh, it's very common. The other thing you'll see is kind of interesting. Uh, let's see. When they built the dam and raised the pond much, sickness resulted and the people died rapidly. Again, you've got this stagnant water around these mill ponds. What does that breed? There you go. Um, in Milford, in the 1850s, the local population um, tore down the dam for the mill pond for this reason. Now, they were really brave about it. They waited till the owner went to Ohio, and the, the wife was there by himself, and then one morning, you know, 40 or 50 of these brave souls showed up and tore down the dam. Um, but th they did, okay? Why? For this reason, okay? Um, mills are usually very notable, okay? The, the mill becomes the center of the community, the economic life of the community. In Lyon Township, everything I've seen is referencing a steam mill. Because apparently there wasn't enough flowing water. I mean, I don't know for sure. It looks to me like there's a few creeks here anyhow. Uh, but all the references in the book are about steam-powered mills. Starting in the 1830s. Industrial Revolution. They don't say Industrial Revolution, but that's what it is. You know, you have steam mills that are operating in most places when you see the steam mill it's they use it as auxiliary power when the water is low but that isn't the comment they used here and it isn't the comment they talk about in royal oak either where there is no flowing water um, so that was kind of interesting um, schools the one room schoolhouse was pretty much ubiquitous um, this gives, uh, you can't, this is Lyon Township, and you can sort of see the township boundaries in the different colors. But just to give you a better idea, this is Holly. The colors are a little bit better here. All of those different colors are different school districts. Some of the school districts overlap township boundaries, and they're called fractional districts on the map. Um, so when you, if you look at any of these kind of maps, you'll see fractional school district number one, which means it's overlapping into the next township. Um, the schools typically, although I didn't see this in Lyon, uh, you will find some comment like this. The first school taught was in the, in the loft of Major Williams Sheep House in the fall of 1821. The teacher was a man named Brett. The first schoolhouse built was in the Williams Settlement in 1822. School was taught by uh, Miss Stevens with 12 pu pupils. The house was built of logs. You're going to see that kind of comment in most townships. Uh, the first schoolhouse is something like this. Now, the, the, the fact is that the state of Michigan, as a territory, passed law, passed law in 1817 that theoretically created school districts and schools in the, the state, in the settled towns or in the settled areas. Uh, it didn't really accomplish much, other than that was the same law that creates the University of Michigan. Uh, it was intended to be kind of a top-down ec uh, educational system in the state. It made virtually no impact on what went on. Those are the schools that got created in the settlements, but the University of Michigan did get created. The township passed laws, uh, or sorry, the territory passed laws in 1827, 1832, 33, um, you know, mandating school districts or schools in settlements of more than 50 children, and then if you had more than 200 children or 200 families or something, then you had to also teach Latin and French. I think they did French because of Detroit and the French settlement in the state, but they did Latin because Latin is the language you needed to learn if you're going to go to university because the great books of Western society are in Latin. So that's why they're teaching Latin. But there wasn't much of that going on. There, was, there were fines for not doing this, but they don't seem to have been enforced. One of the interesting things that you'll see is comments like this. This is from Novi. Male teachers are employed for the winter term and females for the summer. The salaries of the former being generally $45 a month for the men, and those of the latter ranging from $3 to $5 per week with board. So 
you know, $12 to $20 a month for a woman, plus they get their board, and the men get $45 a month. Men teach in the winter, women teach in the summer. Why? Farming. Pardon? Farming. Who's farming? Well, the men typically go out and do the farming. There, there's truth to that, but that's not the real issue. The men that are going out farming in the summer are the 12, 13, 14 year old boys. Yes. <laughs> and, and the boys aren't in school, so the, the, the young women can handle, you know, a classroom of young boys and girls. But when the 15-year-old boys show up in the winter, they're rowdy, okay? And so you need somebody that's got a stick that can whack them upside the head. Okay. I mean, the first thing the male teacher has to do when you show up at the one-room schoolhouse is find the biggest kid and kick the bejeebers out of them. Mm -hmm. And everybody will pay attention, right? <laughs> that kind of mentality. Uh, of course, the wages, and this shows up continually, um, is just, that's what you did. <laughs> you just kind of gave the women less. Um, what is true is that Michigan really is, uh, uh, how many of you heard of Horace Mann? Have you heard of Horace Mann? And what is Horace, Horace Mann's claim to fame? Education. Education. He's usually credited with being the father, if such a term ever is applicable, to public education in America. Uh, Franklin Pierce and Isaac Crary implemented a public school system in Michigan uh, that was, for the time, very sophisticated and pretty much what Horace Mann did in Massachusetts. They just did it two years before Massachusetts and two years before Horace Mann. But Massachusetts is a big state, Horace Mann gets credit. But John Pierce and Isaac Curry from Michigan are really the two guys that did this first in the United States. Now, one of the really important, I mean, and, and again, it's this top-down uh, system, centralized and controlled uh, by a state superintendent. John Pierce was the first state superintendent. Uh, the first state to have a state superintendent was Michigan. One of the other things that happened in Michigan first is that uh, one of the things I didn't mention when I showed you that map of the townships, the land sold from section 16 of every township, uh, uh, section 16 of every township in, in the country were to be devoted to public education. That was by virtue of the 1787 Northwest Ordinance. In Michigan, all of that money went into a state fund by virtue of this law that was passed in 1837, or went into effect in 1837. So you, the state Board of Education, in effect, had this pot of money that came from the sale of all the lands in those Section 16s. And then they could distribute it in such a way that it kind of made sense based on what was going on in the local areas and what the, what the state wanted to accomplish. Um, so it really is a much better way. Because, for example, in Oakland County, what if sec Section 16 is Cass Lake? Then you have nothing. But if you, the law of averages, you kind of group them together so you've got this one common fund and that allows you to distribute the money in a more equitable basis and, in fact, compel compliance so you can get some of that money. Um, so, I mean, those are some of the things about the state education bill uh, written in 1835, but Michigan kind of takes a couple years to become a state, so it doesn't go into effect till 1837. Um, there's a lot of neat things about that. Um, religion in America is, uh, one of my books back there is about that, so we're not gonna go down that path too far. I could spend hours talking about all this stuff. But the, the point is that Michigan is settled in the midst of the Second Great Awakening. And the people in um, this county came from one of the most intense areas of the country with regards to the Second Great Awakening, that is Western New York and they bring that with them. You're gonna find in almost all of these townships some pretty strong references, if you know what you're looking for, of the impact of the Second Great Awakening here. Um, one of the issues that happens here in the Second Great Awakening is, this, is there were just simply not enough ministers in the established churches. And so you had kind of techniques to offset the fact that you didn't have many trained ministers. Uh, first of all, I guess, is that the, the, most of the, the growth of the, in the Second Great Awakening is not led by trained ministers at all. It's led, led by somebody, some preacher, who knows enough of the Bible to become an effective preacher. And whether or not they have any formal training is very much secondary 
doesn't really matter in the growth of the, of the Protestant religions in the Second Great Awakening. But some things that do happen that you'll see continually throughout all of this, uh, throughout the whole book, is references to protracted meetings. Um, let's see. Well, here in, in Lake, in, in Lyon Township, that Methodist church that I had mentioned earlier on, there's reference in 1837 to a a, a protracted meeting that had a considerable impact on the history of the church. It went on for, protracted meetings might go on for weeks, months. And there were 50 converts, six, 50 people that had a religious conversion experience and were drawn into the Methodist church. But you're going to see references to those kinds of things, maybe not in every township, but in most townships. Um, you'll see references to circuit riders. Uh, the Methodists are the big winners in the Second Great Awakening. In 1800, it's one of the smallest denominations in the country. By 1850, it is far and away the largest Protestant denomination in the country. And the circuit riders, who were kind of traveling ministers that rode circuits, 50, 60, 100, 200 miles, on horseback or on foot, visiting cabins and settlements in the frontier areas. There's lots of reference of the circuit riders here in Lyon Township and throughout the county and other techniques to kind of make up for the, um, the lack of trained ministers. Uh, ah, one of the interesting things that does show up in Lyon Township is the presence of, I think, two universalist churches. Now this is kind of interesting and maybe goes down a path that you're not all that interested in, but the idea is this, that the, the idea of are you going to heaven or hell is kind of a central feature of Christianity, at least for these people in, well, it's a central feature of Christianity. It certainly was very important to these people in the Second Great Awakening. By and large, the Protestants would fall into two camps. One is a Calvinist camp that would have been dominant in the, the colonial churches. The Calvinist view is one of predestination. You are, it is predetermined whether or not you're going to go to heaven or hell at the dawn of time. And there's really nothing you can do here on earth to affect whether or not you go to heaven or hell. It's kind of a depressing doctrine, right? Um, then you have an Arminian view that is, you can impact your salvation. It's still God's choice, God's grace, whether you go to heaven or hell, but you can impact it by accepting the Holy Spirit, those 50 conversions that I talked about, that's what's going on, and living a Christian life. And in effect, that will impact your ability to go to heaven. That's the dominant view of the Second Great Awakening. And this Calvinist view is being rejected. The Universalists had a view that a merciful God would let everybody in, in effect. And what happens is that these the in the Second Great Awakening, the dominant view being these Arminians, kind of getting away from the strict Calvinist view, both the Calvinists and the, and the uh, uh, Arminians would have thought these Universalists were complete qu quiet quacks. Okay? And so there was a lot of opposition to the Universalists amongst these uh, the, the mainstream Protestant religions. This is in Farmington. But I, I include it because um, there's two Universalist churches here in Lyon Township, which is really quite unusual. The Universal Church is in no small degree the result of the determination and energy of a Mr. Sergius Lyon. He doesn't have anything to do with the name of the township, but I hadn't even thought about that. Whose object in its erection was not only to secure a place wherein he and his fellow worshipers might hold such service as to their hearts and consciences approved, and this is the interesting part. But to be able to offer the same privilege to other Christians of what other, whatever creed to be able, as Mr. Lyons himself says, to extend to others a courtesy which had been denied to themselves. That is, the, the, the Universalists were denied the ability to kind of uh, practice their own worship, but they were going to extend that privilege to everybody else now that they have their church. Uh, and it's the, the reason for that comment is to do with the fact that the, the Calvinists and the Arminians basically abuse the Universalists. Um, another thing you're going to see a great deal of will be Sunday schools. 
Okay? They are ubiquitous. And in some chapters, um, you know, every church is talking about the fact they've got, you know, the Sabbath school, the Sunday school has been there for, you know, 30 years. There's this many kids. There's this many teachers. The four churches that are mentioned here in Lyon Township, there's two Sunday schools, one of which has, they both have about 100 pupils, uh, you know, six, eight, ten teachers, and then they make reference to one has a library of 600 books, the other has a library of 100 books. Mostly they would have been books that would have been distributed by the American Tract Society, and they would be kind of stories for young kids on kind of leading a good Christian life. The moral of the story is, uh, type of thing. But time after time, you're going to see this reference to the Sabbath schools, Sunday schools, and to the library that they have. Um, town meetings. Um, this shows up in, in every township. You're going to have some section on uh, the first township meeting. And, you know, that's cool. But what's interesting is the positions that wind up th they're electing. You know, in addition to the standard stuff, a sheriff and a council, you know, that kind of stuff. There's a director of the poor. By eight, the late 1830s, there had been a poor law passed in the United States, in Michigan, and each county had to provide a poor farm. But up until then, it was the township's responsibility to take care of the poor, and they had to collect taxes, and there was a director of the poor to manage the problem of the poor. Um, school superintendent, or sorry, school commissioner and inspector of schools, this predates that law of 1837. You're going to see the same thing because the, town, the uh, territory required these things. A highway commissioner and pathmaster. This is really interesting. Um, roads were the responsibility of the townships. Now, not actually at this time yet, but by the time you get to the mid-1840s, the federal government, the state government, have abandoned the idea of building roads. It's entirely up to the local governments. Uh, in Michigan, that means the townships. Every township elected a township supervisor, and they elected district uh, supervisors, pathmasters. Most townships would wind up, at least in this area, eventually with 20, 30, maybe even 40 pathmasters responsible for the roads in their township. Think of that. The township is 36 square miles, and they have 30 pathmasters. Um, it wound up being a terribly inefficient system. Terribly inefficient. Um, and the roads, exactly. You know, the borders when, must have been interesting. Pardon? The borders with the adjoining counties. Well, they had to negotiate that stuff, okay? Um, now, the good news is the roads themselves were mostly defined. Those section boundaries on the Northwest Ordinance, all those section lines that we looked at, by law, in the state of Michigan, those section lines were public highways. So the principal things that these guys needed to do was to create roads that were following along the section lines, which explains why you have 12 mile and 13 mile and 14 mile and all of that. They're all section lines. And they were created initially by these things. You also had fence viewers. What do you need fence viewers for? Stray animals. And usually, there's going to be a pound master. And in most townships, there's going to be wolf bounties, at least in the 1830s. By the time you get to the 1840s, you don't see much about the wolves. But the, the wolves are, I, when I started reading this thing, I was shocked at all the references to wolves. And here's where I, you know, the first few I read, it's like, this is oral history, right? This guy talks about wolves and who the heck knows. But the fact is, you're going to see 30, 40, 50 references to wolves in the early days. Now they're coyotes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, and then this is kind of interesting. I, I didn't get the numbers from Lyon um, uh, because they weren't there. But uh, in Holly Township, uh, I mean, there's all these offices that they're elected. In, eight, in 1838, when the Holly Township um, holds their first town meeting, there are 43 voters in the township. They elect people to 16 offices. <laughs> Again, this is this egalitarian society that we're talking about. 16 people elected to position when there's only 43 people in the county that could vote. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting about 
uh, Lyon Township is that it's the one county that mentions things about finances. Um, currency in the United States was a huge problem up until 1912. And the main issue was that there was no central banking system in the United States after the destruction of the U.S. Bank by Andrew Jackson. Um, the problem was, by law, only gold and silver is the proper mode of, of uh, exchange. Well, that's impractical for two reasons. One, you can't carry around bags of gold, and two, there wasn't enough of it. Uh, so what happened essentially is that banks would be chartered if they got, say, and, and I'm making this up, $10,000 worth of gold coin or silver coin in their vaults, they would be chartered to issue as much as, say, $50,000 worth of paper money. And the paper money wasn't really money, but it was a kind of a bill of exchange. It was almost like a check. And that paper, that check, could circulate in the community, but at some point, if somebody wanted to go to the bank and get their gold and silver, they could do that. The problem with that is there was not very good restriction on how much paper you were actually going to print. And so it was very common for people to print more paper than they had gold and silver to justify. The check on that for a time was the U.S. Bank, because as soon as the U.S. Bank got paper notes from state chartered banks, they'd cash that in for gold and silver which meant that the state banks had to make sure that they had enough gold and silver on hand to meet the demands that the, that the U.S. bank was going to put on them. So that it kept them from overprinting paper. Andrew Jackson smashed the U.S. bank, um, and then as a part of kind of the democratization of America, it became um, kind of the logic that, well, everybody should be able to start a bank. So these general banking laws were passed around the United States, Michigan included, in 1837 after this banking law was passed. Forty banks t uh, started operation within a matter of a year or two. They all failed. The economy of the United States went into a depression. Uh, one of those banks was the Kensington Bank, which is just up the road here a couple of miles. Uh, and they uh, basically put $50,000 of paper in circulation with no gold and silver to back it up. It was all worthless. So it's the only township where there's this is mentioned. Um, there's also another mention about another problem, which was counterfeiting. Uh, up here is some place called Bogus Corners. I don't know whether that's a term that still exists or not, but there you go. So, there we go. Um, and then we're going to stop. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff I could talk about, but we're going to have to kind of move on here. I wanted to finish up by spending a few minutes looking at some of these lithographs of farmers' homes, what are called palatial residences in the front piece of the book. Okay, so right here palatial residences. This is the title page of the book. The reason I want to do this is that when you look at these pictures, you look at this and go, oh wow, that's pretty cool. Next. Oh gee, that's pretty cool. I want you to stop. As you go through this book, when you get an opportunity, I want you to take time to look at these pictures and really look carefully. What's here? Um, so what do you see in this picture? This is Alfred Windy Eight's farm up in the northern part of Waterford Township. What do you see here? A train, right? The railroad is king in America in 1877. And having access to a railroad, which Oakland County does in pretty good order, we have, a, by square miles, we have a lot of railroad in this county. Now that's unusual, but uh, because we're close to Detroit, that's, that's why. Um, and you're going to find a number of pictures where railroad tracks, if not the train locomotive itself, show up in these, these uh, prints. What else do you see? Horses and sheep. Yep, horses. Actually, those are hogs. They look like sheep, but they're not. And notice the beauty of these horses. They're good-looking horses. There are no swaybacks here. You're not going to see any swaybacks in any of these pictures. Justin Morgan. Oh, yeah, they're, they're just all good-looking horses. Justin Morgan, my goodness, I haven't heard that in a long time. Um, yeah, exactly, telegraph lines. Okay. Again, transportation revolution, industrial revolution. They don't mention it, but there it is. Um, what else do you see? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the barns, the, the outbuildings on these pictures will be surprising to you. The other thing that may be surprising, would you call that a palatial estate? It's an upright wing. 
You know, there's nothing fancy about that house. Right? You'll see some that are kind of palatial estates, but most of them are these winging uprights. They're pretty ordinary. Okay? What else do you see? The hill back there, Waterford Hills, right? I was going to ask if that was Alpine. <laughs> no, that would be further north. Um, do you see the lake? Yeah. Oh, right here. Oh, yeah. Right? Windmill. Windmill? For what? Windmill. But for what? What's it for? Water. There you go. Bringing water up. Um, now, what you'll be very hard to see, but you can see when you actually look in the book, there's a couple of kids. And what you can't see is they've got a hoop. So they're playing with the hoop down the road. And then what is even harder to see in this picture, back here there's a couple of people playing out on the lawn. You know what they're playing? Okay. Croquet. In the pictures in this book, you will probably find 20, 30 of these homes where somebody's playing croquet on the front lawn. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Here you have the buttons, the cheery buttons. What do you see here? Now these guys do live in Lyon Township. What do you notice? Pardon? Cows and a horse, right? Carriage. Carriage. This is Grand River, by the way. The buttons lived straddled Grand River. They had a pretty big farm. But again, notice the house. I'll show you some later that, in my view, kind of qualify as palatial estates. This does not. I mean, again, a lot of outbuildings. Okay, it's a big farm, uh, but the home itself is no great shakes. Summer kitchen? Could be. Exactly. Back here? Here, maybe? I don't know. Um, what's this? A flock of some Sheep. Michigan was the fourth leading producer of sheep and wool in the country throughout most of the 19th century. Uh, after 1850. And Oakland County would have been one of the top one or two or three counties in the state in raising sheep. You're going to see a lot of sheep on these farms. Um, and there's your, your windmill again. Notice the road. It's not, it looks like concrete, doesn't it? It wasn't, guaranteed. But it's a straight line. That is a section line. Okay. Uh, well, actually it isn't. It's Grand River. But it's a straight line. What do you see here? Barns and the house. Yeah, and the barns, the outbuilding, the windmill, mm -hmm. more sheep. Okay, in addition to the cattle. What's this over here? It's like orchard. Orchard. Exactly. One of the things that's true about Michigan farms, in fact, farms in the Midwest generally, is that they may have started out growing a lot of wheat and corn. But as that industry moves west with these larger farms further west and more open terrain, farms towards the east, including Michigan, tended to be more diversified. Let's raise some sheep, let's raise some cattle, let's have some orchards. Again, Michigan becomes the leading producer of apples in the country, I think. And the leading apple producer in the state is Oakland County. We come by these apples or these cider mills, quite honestly. We were a big fruit producer in the state, in the country. Uh, and one of the things that happens as I don't know if it was here or here, no, no examples there. But in, in many of these pictures you're going to see orchards. And sometimes the, or the trees are this big and sometimes they're this big. Okay, they're just planting new orchards. Notice the road. Now this is more like it. All rutted. Um, in the summer this stuff dried up and you had these ruts to contend with. In the spring and fall it was mud. Um, this is not far from here in Novi. This is a big orchard. Uh, you know, fruit ridge farm. But here's your palatial estate, right? Yeah, that's yeah, I mean, that's a real one. <clears throat> Notice what they're doing here? Ah, that's a well manicured croquet field. <laughs> <laughs> they're playing croquet out here. Looks like a pond. Looks like a. Yeah? Uh, wrought iron fence. Uh, split rails over here. Different kinds of fencing. 
Look at these things, okay, when you get the chance. Uh, the, and one of the things, I, I put this one up here because this is the only one that looks realistic to me. The rest of them are squeaky clean. This one isn't so squeaky clean. You know, broken down fences, there's tree stumps here that you can't hardly see. The road isn't as bad as it could be, but it, it's clearly not that concrete thing that look, you see in some places. That style of uh, the split rails looked like t because they were freestanding. Yeah, they were. They were. Easier to put them up. A um, lot of trees in the county uh, use these cedar trees to make these split rail fences. Um, you know. So there you go. Questions? That woman was really good looking. Oh, that last one. We were talking about this. Uh, he might never call on that house. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't call on any of these houses. When you look at the pictures of these, there's not a smile anywhere in the book. Yeah. You smile back then. No, and we were kind of talking about the reasons why, and, and I think there's three things to consider. First of all, these were very serious-minded religious people, um, and the idea of looking frivolous was kind of outside of their frame of reference. Um, these, they don't get pictures often. Yeah. So you get one in your life, you don't want to look, Hi, how you doing? Yeah. Right? You want to look serious to reflect life. The other thing is you had a time exposure. Easier to sit there like this than it is to try and hold a smile, mm -hmm. okay? And you know, you've got that time exposure on the cameras in this day. And the other thing that was always the dodge that I heard, that, that I kind of grew up with, is that they didn't smile because they had bad teeth. Uh -huh. yeah. I don't know. Somewhere in there is probably the truth, and there may be other variations on this thing. Questions? Interesting about town and range, because up until, um, Oh, what's that new thing that they, you can do it on your phone. GPS? GPS. Well, water well drillers had to send in their well logs to the county offices based on range and town numbers. Yeah, I'm sure. It was the only way to do it. My husband was one. Yeah, it was the only way to do it. Yeah. Right? Yes? I had a question when you were talking about the surveying. The, Michigan is pretty wooded. I mean, there is no straight line. You've got trees and... Uh, Therein lies the problem. <laughs> this was an incredible undertaking. Yeah. And if the range line, or if the, uh, the, the survey line went across the lake, you had to figure out a way to mark it off on the other side. You also have to... In, in the swamps? You also I, have to acknowledge the fact that as you go north, the meridian lines change too, and that's why you will see, even within uh, Lyon Township, you'll see, like... Chuck Road is offset yeah. above eight mile. Yep. Yeah. Because of those lines. Yeah, the roads go straight and then every once in a while they have to skip over yeah. the north south lines, yeah. the range lines. Yeah. Because, you know, as you move towards the North Pole. The same thing. You don't have that problem east west, but you have it going north south. And you know, get out and follow one of these 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 mile roads out in the boondocks and you, after I don't know how far, uh, twenty miles, fifteen miles, you're gonna wind up skipping over, you know, a few hundred yards one way or the other. And the lots on the north side of a square mile are always smaller. Ah. <laughs> so the lines are coming in. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you for your interest. Um, Very interesting. Thank you.